All right. So I guess the number of participants has participated as more and more participants might be pouring in as we as time passes. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this web talk on behalf of both the American Council in Germany and Atlantic Brücke. Uh, thank you, everyone. We are now at 70 participants um, for dialing in into this conversation from across all over uh, the transatlantic world. I'm Jakob Fleming. I'm a program manager with uh, Atlantic Brücke, and I will have the honor to moderate uh, today's web talk. Um, we have all witnessed the incredible series of events unfolding in US electoral politics in the past month. It all started with Joe Biden's uh, very poor debate performance on June 27th, it was followed by mounting pressure from within the Democratic Party for him to drop out. Then there was the ass uh, assassination attempt uh, against former President Donald Trump uh, at a rally in Pennsylvania on July 13th. A week later, President Biden ultimately announced he would drop out of the race and endorse his Vice President Kamala Harris and just two hours ago, the Democratic National Committee started the virtual wall call in which the delegates are expected to formally designate her as the Democratic nominee for president. So within just four weeks, the dynamics in this election cycle have been turned upside down multiple times. That's why we at the American Council on Germany and Atlantic Brücke have decided um, to host this joint web talk with two Terrific experts that will help us uh, with putting the past week's events into perspective, assess the current state of the presidential race as it unfolds now, and evaluate the election's impact on transatlantic uh, relations as both our organizations um, are in the realm uh, of transatlantic relations. Joining us uh, from Vice President Harris's home state of California is uh, Ambassador John Emerson. It's most likely pointless to introduce you to this audience um, as you are the chairman of the American Council on Germany, who served at, as the US ambassador to Germany between 2013 and 2017. But I would like to stress you're an incredibly experienced insider of the Democratic Party, having worked for both President Clinton, President Obama in various capacities, and now you're actively uh, engaged with the Harris campaign. Uh, thank you for your precious time to join us, Ambassador. Well, thank you, Jacob. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned the uh, uh, the announcement that happened, I guess, what, 11, 12 days ago. I was literally uh, in the midst of, uh, in Berlin, in the midst of a fireside chat with Ambassador Emily Haber for the American Council on Germany young to kick off the Young Leaders Conference, the annual Young Leaders Conference, and uh, we were sitting up there talking and all of a sudden the news broke first that Biden had dropped out. And then secondly, about 10 minutes later, that he had endorsed Kamala Harris. And I, I would say that had a slight impact on the direction of our uh, of our conversation, which was great. And it's also um, a wonderful pleasure uh, not only to have our two organizations, which were founded as sister organizations, I don't know, some 60 plus years ago, uh, working together on this, but also to have my good friend, uh, Juliana Schäuble, uh, on uh, this with me. Uh, I believe she's on a train, which is why you see the bouncing around, but I appreciate the fact that uh, uh, she has the San Francisco Bay, or the uh, Golden Gate Bridge in the background there. I don't know if you can see it on your Zoom, uh, but uh, that's a, a nice nod to, Kamala Harris's hometown, as a matter of fact. And then I guess the final point is you mentioned the voting that is about to go on. I am a delegate to the convention and literally right before this phone call just received my ballot. So when we're done here, I'm going to go online and download it and sign it and, and send it all uh, send it all in. So this is all happening in real time. It is. And you have until Monday to cast your ballot, right? Yeah, I'll do it today, though. Okay, great. And you mentioned it, um, Juliana Schäuble is joining us from the train um, from another West Coast, not from San Francisco, but uh, on her way to Zult from the West Coast of Schleswig-Holstein. She has been reporting on American politics as the US correspondent for uh, the Berlin-based daily Der Tagesspiegel since 2018. And she's one of the most experienced and most respected uh, German correspondents in the United States. And special thank you, Juliana, for taking your time while you are actually about to start your vacation. 
Yeah, and I um, apologize because I am literally on the auto train <laughs> and the connection might not be as good and I'm a little bit shaky. I try my best. I um, German um, Deutsche Bahn and uh, we will we'll see how it works out. We but I'm happy, to be here. I'm happy to see John. We talked a lot in the last weeks. Exciting times. Now the connection worked perfectly well, so we hope this will continue as we as we progress with this talk. Before we begin and actually uh, discuss about the issues, um, I would like to encourage you all in the audience to submit questions to both Ambassador Emerson and Juliana Schäuble. Um, you can do that through the Q&A box um, you find on your screen and to just drop them in as they come to your mind. We will try to take them up in the last couple of uh, 20 minutes of this discussion. So Ambassador Ann Emerson, you actually already got into, into it. You're a delegate to the Democratic Convention. You're very close to the Democratic Party. Um, so maybe can you start by giving us an idea of, of the mood in the, in the Democratic Party of after all what happened in the past weeks, you described it, and before the actual Democratic National Convention um, taking place in three weeks in Chicago? Well, first of all, uh, Jakob, let me let me just say that uh, I, what I will be providing here is analysis, not advocacy. I'm obviously I'm a Democrat. I'm a, a supporter of uh, of Kamala Harris and, and close friends of both her and, and Doug Emhoff, her husband. But uh, but I'm not going to be giving you a political spiel. I'm going to you know kind of call it as I see it, uh, almost as an analyst. Uh, so I just wanted to wanted to clarify that. Uh, you know, what's fascinating about this is we have had three black swan events in about in this election in about a month's period of time. We first of all had the absolutely disastrous Joe Biden debate uh, against Donald Trump, which which I think for it for people who are concerned that perhaps he was too old to run for another four years and and more importantly, to prosecute uh, an effective presidential campaign. I think the debate performance confirmed that for a lot of them. And for others who felt uh, that he was uh, was capable, there was just concern about, you know, for swing voters and for young voters and people who are not enthusiastic, how could they unsee what they saw in the debate, get beyond that and and become enthusiastic supporters? So, so there was definite concern, which is, I think, was clearly reflected and well, very well reported in the press, uh, coming from within people of uh, people within the Democratic Party. Then we had the assassination attempt on Donald Trump, that iconic photograph, which so dramatically uh, shifted the uh, the image. You had the image of Donald Trump with blood on his face and his fist raised and the American flag flying behind. And then the image of Joe Biden in that debate, that was what people had in their heads. And that led to greater uh, concern. And then the third black swan event was when Joe Biden did the absolutely unprecedented thing of walking away from power. You know, Vladimir Putin didn't do that. Xi Jinping didn't do that. Donald Trump tried not to do that in 2020. But but Biden just said, you know what? I care more about my country and my party and the future of our country than I do about my own political career. And as much as I'd love to continue being president, uh, I'm gone after January 20th, 2025. I mean, and then through his support to Kamala Harris. So to answer your so those are three black swan events. And let me just tell you, I bet we're going to have a fourth in this campaign. I mean, this has been such a highly unusual campaign. I think we, we, you know, we, it, it's going to go like this. It really will. And I think the two biggest immediate impacts of the Biden decision and the Harris endorsement were number one, a giant sigh of relief and enthusiasm, and then subsequent enthusiasm from the base of the Democratic Party. Uh, all of a sudden, age isn't the Democratic Party's problem, it's the Republican Party's problem. And uh, and inexperience isn't the Democratic Party's problem, it's the Republican Party's problem when you look at some of the challenges that J.D. Vance has had on his run it and his on his rollout. And uh, I, there were two constituency groups that are essential for the Democrats to do well in a presidential election. You're young people and, and it's the black community. 
And in both of those groups, there was a waning of enthusiasm. And with young people, I'd say a decided lack of enthusiasm, absence of enthusiasm for the Biden presidency. Harris coming in, that has completely changed. There, there was a massive enthusiasm gap between the bases of both parties. The Republican Party, particularly coming out of their convention, had a huge boost of enthusiasm. Democrats were down here. Now it's parity. So what the second point is, is what this all means is we're back to what I've been saying. Many of you have heard me say this for the last year and a half. This is going to be a razor close election. Uh, probably won't be all that close in the popular vote front as, as in uh, literally every election except for 2004, the Democrat will win the popular vote. But um, from an electoral college standpoint, this is literally going to be back to a situation we were in in 2000 and 2016 and, 2000 and, and, and 2020, uh, where it's going to come down to a handful of votes in a handful of states. And I honestly believe that the weekend before the election will be too soon to actually predict what's going to happen in the election. That, that, that's a major consequence of that. We're now back to parity and we're back to a very, very close election. You're on mute there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there was a lot in there that we will come back to. Um, you mentioned that there was a whole new enthusiasm coming with uh, Kamala Harris taking over uh, on top of the Democratic ticket. Um, Juliana, I would like to turn this to you. Um, looking at this more more strategically, um, in your observation, what what distinguishes like in the past 10 days since, since uh, Kamala Harris took over the Harris campaign strategy besides her age, obviously, from, from President Biden's um, strategy as, as we saw it uh, up until his announcement to drop out. Is there a new message? Is there a new tone or a new line of attack that we can see now? I would say yes. Um, it's clearly, um, first of all, it's clearly much better mood. Um, I mean, she is just uh, smiling and laughing. There's lots of reporting, a lot of lots of reporting on her laughing. But she's also there is this feeling of freshness of a new start that is kind of um, pushing the party. Um, and I think that's that was very important after a couple of months, where the biggest fears of many Democrats was what mistake. Could the president make next um, in 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 giving a speech at the uh, NATO uh, uh, summit? Um, and I also think she's, um, as we saw last uh, yesterday in Atlanta at her first big rally, um, that she's also clearly talking to Donald Trump. She's clearly naming him. She is calling him out. She's she's um, she's she 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 talks of. Um, she, he's he's not he's afraid of debating her when he was kind of trying to back out of it. So she's um, apparently open for the confrontation. Um, and from from President Biden, we were used to hear the other guy. He he rarely mentioned um, the former president by name, and and that has that has changed. I think that is one important thing: the good mood, um, the the change in the in the in the attack mode um, a little bit. But she's also trying, and I'm not sure yet how long that will last, because the speech was also a little bit short uh, yesterday, I have to say, I think 17, 18 minutes in Atlanta. We'll see how that, um, how much longer that is going to be. But she also tries to talk better, clear, clearer about the economy. One of the problems that was um, um, talked about a lot um, with the, the, the term Bidenomics was that people wouldn't understand it. And so the question was always, why is the economy better? Inflation is, is going down, employment is going up, but the people still have this feeling that problems were not really you didn't put the finger into, into the into the wound. You didn't want to see that people were struggling with higher gas prices, higher prices for um, for for food and everything. And we all noticed it. I mean, we all see that our bills are going up. And um, I'm not paid in in the US, but um, many of us have uh, have been struggling with this. And I I think there's that we can already see that he's trying to. And John, uh, please correct me. To, to to find a different tone in that, and and what I also uh, 
think is is funny was this um this uh, kind of competition and who is weirder and the democrats now try to frame donald trump and shady Benz as weird and also as dangerous but not as like like only dangerous but also weird so trying to not make him bigger than he actually is i think that is very important um because we 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 have seen this in 2016 and in 2020 he can always double he can always put something else on top of it he can get worse he can uh, he can call you names and all this so if you make fun of him that's probably the worst thing you can I do. I couldn't agree with that more I think that um uh kind of two basic frame changes if you will on the debate were number one moving away from this democracy is at stake which ironically, when you pull that, uh, a slight majority of Americans said Donald Trump was better at protecting democracy than Joe Biden was. Now, now, part of that, I think, is because many of the voters in the Republican Party, most of the voters in the Republican Party actually believe Trump's big lie that the election was stolen. So, of course, needs to protect democracy from that standpoint. But the frame was changed right out of the box by Kamala Harris to one about freedom. Freedom from having the government tell women what to do with their bodies, as an example. And, and I think the freedom frame is much better than this sort of esoteric democracy is at stake. And people don't really know what that means. And then the second thing is, as Juliana pointed out, was she took the attack or the, the way that Kamala Harris is dealing with Trump. And this is really her. This isn't something that a pollster can teach you or whatever. You have to have the political skill to be able to do that. She's transitioned it away from being mad and angry and almost a get off my lawn, you know, that sort of, you know, old man thing of get off my lawn, you know, that, that you see in movies periodically. Change it from that to using humor uh, to, to in fact, ridicule Donald Trump. And I, I agree with you, Yolanda. I think that's the only way to deal with him because You'll have not just the outrage of the day, you have the outrage of the hour with this guy. And so he just, you know, keeps moving the news cycle and staying in the news. And I think there's no way you can sort of compete with all this. A perfect example is what happened yesterday when he was speaking to the Association of Black Journalists and said, well, I mean, when did Kamala Harris decide to turn black? Well, how about the day she was born? But in any event, uh, it, 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 I mean, it was an absolutely outrageous comment, but instead of taking it on head on and getting mad and going at him, Kamala Harris basically said, you know what, this is just another example of um, of division, trying to him trying to sow division and discord. And you know what, America deserves better than that, uh, which I thought was a absolutely uh, the right tone and the right approach to handle it. And I don't think he knows how to deal with this yet. I don't think he's quite figured that one out. There's plenty of vulnerability she has, but right now they haven't quite figured that out. Yeah, we will definitely come to, to talk about the Republican campaign and the Trump campaign and their response to, to the changes that the Democratic ticket obviously has have undergone uh, in the recent week. Um, but before we do that, I would like to briefly um, address um, what Kamala Harris is expected to do uh, by Tuesday. She's expected to announce the vice presidential candidate, and she will even uh, hit the campaign trail in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on Tuesday um, with her vice presidential candidate. So and you mentioned, Ambassador, that that the young voters and the black voters, they are a key constituency um, are these considerations that she's taken into account when, when she's now picking her vice presidential candidate? Like who, who are the candidates and what rationale is behind those potential picks? Well, I would say virtually without exception, the candidates are white, moderate males. I mean, there are a couple of others in there, but that's pretty much what we're looking at here. And that is a pretty good tell in terms of what her objectives are. Her objective is a very, very pragmatic one. She wants to put someone on the ticket who, of course, will be a good governing partner for her. And at the end of the day, the, the kind of chemistry test between uh, Kamala Harris and the people she's interviewing will be a very, very important factor in her decision. That's something none of us have visibility to. Um, but she's looking for people that are going to, well, while she's helping to bring back the Democratic base, I think she's looking for people that can help her 
uh, in swing voter land, and particularly with older white working class voters, which was a strength that Joe Biden had uh, and 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 less of a strength that she had. And so she that's a that's an important place to do it. And somebody who's going to look, look, if if uh, Kamala Harris wins Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin, it's game over, uh, assuming she holds the uh, other states, she could even lose um Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada, but she basically holds everything else that Biden won in 2020. She she's going to be uh, in, including that one electoral vote in Nebraska. She would be uh, uh, elected president because she'd have the 270 plus electoral votes. So those Midwestern states are really really important, and so I think fundamentally she's looking for someone that will help her. Uh, solidify her position in swing vote land. And I, I, I don't know, you know, the fa the favorite parlor game in Washington right now is, you know, who's going to be the vice presidential nominee. Honestly, none of us know. Do not assume from the fact that she said she's going to make the announcement in Philadelphia that it's going to be Josh Shapiro, the governor of Pennsylvania, who I think would be a very strong choice. Uh, but uh, don't assume that because often uh, vice presidential candidates are announced in places other than their home state. So I just put that out there. All right. Um, Juliana seems to have some connection issues, but just turning this to you, maybe, um, Ambassador said that Joe Shapiro certainly is a candidate, but we shouldn't assume from the campaign rally being held in Philadelphia um, that it is actually him. What is what is your take on that? Who is who is in the pool position? Well, I mean, if, you know, Pennsylvania, go ahead, Juliana, sorry, go ahead, you, your turn. I, well, I, I think it would be uh, Josh Shapiro. I think um, he, he is, I was, I saw him on Saturday. I went to, uh, uh, to Philadelphia to, to see him speaking at, at a, at a smaller event and uh, it suddenly were like more than 300 people showing up. So he's an amazing uh, speaker. I think it's interesting. I, I still have this 5% um, uh, doubt, but it's probably also the, the journalistic view. Why could she not just take Gretchen Whitmer? <laughs> John, explain this to me. Because she, I mean, if she if she would choose her, it's also it's also an important swing state. And she could say, you you, you tell me why two women are too much. You know, you 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 give me the arguments. I, I don't think she's going to do it, but I think it's... It, the five percent in my head that it's uh, not going to go out until it's um, proven wrong, probably. Well, so uh, you know, I by. personally don't think two women are too much, but my guess is they're polling that, and my guess is the personal relationship will be key. And the other thing is that she is doing much. I'm, I'm apologizing for the connection. I couldn't change oh. it. Oh, no problem. And she's doing much better in Michigan than she is in Pennsylvania right now. Although obviously these polls are. They, they haven't yet settled into where we're uh, ultimately going to be. You know, the other one you hear about, of course, is Mark Kelly, who's the senator from uh, Arizona, could help her on border issues, a former astronaut, the former, uh, uh, you know, war hero, married to Gabby Giffords, the congresswoman who was literally shot in the face by uh, a constituent. Uh, tragically, she survived. Uh, she's a leader in the gun uh, you know, re responsible gun safety movement. And uh, uh, and he would be also, I think, a very, very uh, a strong candidate. I mean, some questions as to how, you know, he does in the uh, in the Midwest. But, um, uh, you know, there and there are several others that they're they're looking at. So she's clearly looking at Gretchen Whitmer. But my guess is there it'll be more of a conservative in the sense of cautious rather than ideological choice. Uh, it, it's Guy Waltz in uh, governor of Minnesota is also very much uh, in the mix. He's, uh, I think, um, very much from a working class background, almost similar to J.V.D. Vance's background. Um, and uh, and he's just delightful on television. He's the one that coined the weird concept. And, uh, and all, I, I guess my only issue there is She's doing really well in Minnesota, too, at this point. Uh, Biden wasn't. She's probably flipped at about eight or nine points in terms of how much better she does than he does there. And uh, and and whether, you know, they would want to go with one of the Midwestern states. But uh, bottom line is, who knows? So much of this will depend on the personal chemistry, who she feels will be a governing partner 
in the way that she was for Joe Biden. That's that's you're with this person every day. You probably see your vice president as president uh, in, in today's era. You see your vice president more than anybody else other than your spouse. So that's important. Yeah, so, so I guess we just have to wait until at least Tuesday to see who the vice presidential pick is. Um, you, you mentioned Governor Walz for for coining the weird the weird attack primarily against JD Vance. Um, Juliana, you were you were present at the Rep uh, Republican convention two weeks ago in Milwaukee, and as uh, the ambassador pointed out, the GOP um, seemed to be more united than ever um, two weeks ago. Since then, we saw that. Reportedly, uh, Donald Trump uh, has some second thoughts about J.D. Vance, and they are now maybe questioning if he is the right pick. Um, how would you describe the change that has happened since since the convention two weeks ago? How would I describe just the last word? Sorry. The the change in in the mood or the change in okay. the approach um, in the Republican Party. No, I mean, uh, Milwaukee was, it feels like a year ago, um, but this is how the last five weeks uh, feel. Um, we have a year every week. Um, the mood was like Trump could double down on himself. So he even more of himself would make it even more safe to win the election. And and there's a doubt that this is actually true now. I'm, I'm not sure what he actually thinks and talks because we don't know. Um, we hear and we read that he has doubts that he didn't like um, that J.D. Vance was talking a lot about himself um, at the convention and not about Trump. Uh, this uh, with Trump um, also not something he actually likes too much. I'm, I'm this this discussion about changing um, the running mate. I'm not sure if Trump is a person who would do that because it would make him weak, kind of. He would would have done the wrong decision, would have made the wrong decision. Is On the other hand, we never know what Trump is going to do next. So I think it was kind of a shock, um, um, even though it was not surprising that there's there's talk about changing um, from um, President Biden to Vice President Harris. The, 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 the way it happened, the organized way, the, the calmness of the party, the, the non-chaos that we saw in the last 10 days must have been surprising to the Republicans. And they tried to do it. I remember in Milwaukee, uh, one, one discussion um, with um, uh, one of Trump's um, campaign advisors, and he said if they would try to do that, this is going to be a coup. So they, they already tried to frame it as something illegal, and they, they had hope that people get upset about this change of, 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 the, of the running uh, of um, of the of the candidate but the people didn't get upset because the people understood that this is a there's a no way out situation it it couldn't go on like this so this was a miscalculation and they don't have much time to to make it up they they are they're going aggressively i think yesterday was not an accident what trump did i think it's pure calculation it might be the wrong calculation i don't know yet i i was surprised that all major american news outlets uh, made an um, an alert uh, out of his comments because I'm not surprised that he makes these kind of co comments that he attacks somebody by race or anything. So it it also depends on the, how the media is going to treat these kind of debates. Um, and I'm part of it, but not American part. But it's um, the Republicans will try to break the streak of good news for the Democratic Party. They try to break the string of like these these organized discussions about the issues you want to you want to move forward with, and um, that is an open open bet if they're going to be successful with it um if we if if the same things happen as in 2016 that we that the discussion get distracted from what's really important is is the identification of kamala harris really important for um the election no it's not but it can assume a lot of time and oxygen so they they try desperately they are not i mean He's also, I think his approval rates also went up. Um, but when I saw something yesterday, uh, Kamala Harris' approval rates went up, but also Donald Trump's approval rates went up. So it is going to be a um, very, very long nine, uh, nine, 95, 97 days until yeah. we know. It's three months, and you both mentioned it. Like yesterday, Donald Trump appeared at the National Association of Black Journalists making some statements about Kamala Harris's identity. Um, he also called the Biden administration full of fascists, Marxists, and communists, I believe. 
um, in the recent days. But at the same time, we have seen, I believe, two days ago, his campaign aggressively distancing themselves from Project 2025, the 1,000 page long hard right wing uh, agenda drafted by the Heritage Foundation. Um, Trump himself and then now his, his senior advisors were very aggressive in, in their language to distance uh, themselves from that. Like uh, Ambassador Emerson, like how serious can we take this? Or do you see a strategy behind that? At the one hand, making these more radical statements, and on the other hand, distancing the campaign from Project 25? I, I think it's going to be tough. Uh, you know, let's just say the Republicans are trying to hang some of Kamala Harris's comments during the, the very left-leaning primary in 2019 uh, for the 2020 election around her neck. I think Donald Trump's going to have a much harder time uh, moving away from what the commitments are in Project 2025 than Kamala Harris will be in saying, look, for the last three and a half years, I've been governing as a centrist, and these are my positions, and this is where I intend to go. Um, and the reason is two things. Number one, his vice president, J.D. Vance, wrote the foreword to the 900-page Project 2025, extolling its virtue. And secondly, many of the ideas in there are um, ideas that emanate from statements that Donald Trump has made himself. So, uh, so I, I, I actually think he's going to try to, you know, oh, you know, we're disavowing it or so on and so forth. And all the Democrats need to do is pick five or six uh, specifics in Project 2025 that Donald Trump cannot run away from because he may have said over and over and over that he was for those ideas, like the mass deportations of immigrants, and as, as an example, and and just keep hammering on those and 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 don't make it just Project 2025, but make it the specific uh, aspects of that that are quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, quite distasteful, I think, in particular to swing voters and, and you know, to many Americans. And so uh, I, so I think he's going to have a, a tough time just running away from it. And the Democrats are certainly not going to let him, they're going to try not to let him get away from that. And, and I think the best way to do it is take the specifics where you have Trump video talking about those things and, and just keep hammering on those. I, as I've understood you correctly, um, the the election will be won in the center. Kamala Harris will try to portray herself as governing from the center. And we've also seen in recent days uh, an ad, her campaign release on immigration, which was portraying her as pretty tough on immigration. Um, also considering the attacks that uh, have already come from, from the Trump campaign, portraying her as a border star, which has messed up the border um, in the Biden administration. And she now tried to change the narrative and saying that she was actually tough on immigration and that is what it was actually Donald Trump um, preventing the border deal from happening in Congress. Um, Juliana, do you see there like a new strategy, like to gravitate toward the center and to counter the attack uh, of the Trump campaign portraying her as too liberal? I, I think it's that's for that what, what the Democratic Party is or the Harris campaign is trying. I think it will be one of the tougher issues um, to talk about because the border is one of the most important issues for many voters and for many Republican or conservative voters. It is the number one issue. At least that's what they say. So they have to um, they kind of have to make up for, especially in the beginning of the administration, this impression that they didn't want to see a problem at the border um, when everybody was talking about a crisis, but the Biden administration said, no, there is no crisis. And people had the feeling it is different, a little bit similar to the economy. So I think that's what they have to make up. They have to say, right, right now the numbers are down. So we just had new numbers. So um, border crossings, et cetera, is down. It's also not the season for that. But it, I was at the border a couple of months ago and it was the same thing. So right now it's a good time to, sorry, Time to um, shift the <laughs> shift the debate, um, and I think that's what they're going to try. They they uh, I, I it will be interesting to see how how uh, how um, 
uh, together the Democratic Party will stay in this debate because it is also a very emotional issue within the Democratic Party. You have a lot of progressive people who, who don't want to have too hard stands on the border and Biden had his issues um, with that too. So I'm not sure how much the Democratic Party is actually going to talk about the border. Yesterday it was very brief in her speech. We'll see how that is going to be the next in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I think the tell will be on a lot of these issues will be her acceptance speech at the convention, which is the Thursday night of the of the convention. I think the 22nd of August, uh, that will be where, you know, she's going to sort of reintroduce herself to the American people. I, I think the viewership on that will be very, very high, by the way, because I think there's a lot of curiosity about her and she'll have an opportunity to lay out her agenda for the country for the next four years. And um I honestly think you're you're absolutely right. I mean, just just as uh, I think uh, border security is the strongest issue the Republicans have going into this, uh, and reproductive freedom is the strongest issue the Democrats have going into this. If you just if you take the candidates out of it and just talk about uh, issues, and I think that. Um, uh, it, to get into was I the borders are or not, she actually wasn't, but the, they're pretty well effectively branding her as that is not as effective as simply saying, here's what I've done. Here's what I believe. Here's what I'm going to do. And to your last point, uh, Juliana, I think, uh, you know, there come times in politics when the progressive, the far right or the far left are so desperate for a win. And, and, and by the way, the 1992 campaign that I was deeply involved in for Bill Clinton for president, it was an example of this. You could not get the Democratic nomination if you were pro-death penalty in from 72 all the way through 88. It was a it was a deal killer. And yet Bill Clinton came in because Michael Dukakis lost in 88 in part because he was conceived, perceived as weak on crime. Clinton came in as governor of Arkansas and pro-death penalty. And the party allowed that to happen because they recognized the need for that. My guess is that where the, the frame of the party and the attitude and the enthusiasm and the, the desire to defeat Donald Trump is such that she'll be given a fair amount of latitude uh, on issues like, uh, like immigration, just to answer your last question. All right, so, so we have talked about reproductive rights briefly. We have talked about that reproductive right for the Democrats and immigration for the Republicans are the key issues for this election. We need to, before we before we turn to some to some questions from the audience, also talk about the the important issues also for for transatlantic relations. I mean, obviously, what what Europeans are looking most in this election and potentially also worry about the most is is Ukraine and how, how stable U.S. support for Ukraine will be after this election. Um, maybe let me ask you, let, let me ask it this way, Ambassador. Um, also, Yuyana, if you want to um, weigh in on that, um, beside the straight out anti-Ukraine rhetoric, we have heard from folks like J.D. Vance um, from time to time. The Trump campaign basically argues that under Biden, we have supported Ukraine sufficiently for them to not lose, but not sufficiently for them to actually win and drive Russia out of eastern Ukraine. Do you think that there's any validity to this criticism? And will there be a new Ukraine policy to expect from a potential Harris administration? Let me let me just open by saying, with as it relates to the transatlantic relationship, there is a very important announcement that was made today about a prisoner exchange between a number of uh, Western prisoners that Russia has illegally and uh, unethically and immorally been holding, and some prisoners uh, that we have been holding, uh, largely assassins and uh, 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 you know money launderers, et cetera, going back to Russia. This would not have happened without Germany. It would not have happened without the incredible support and help of the German government. And I, I just want to pause and and on behalf of our country, uh, I can't really, I, I can speak for it as a citizen, not as ambassador anymore, but on behalf of our country, offer a thank you to Germany for that. And that is an example of the high quality and the deep and abiding transatlantic relationship that honestly, I think Joe Biden helped to rebuild after the four years of Donald Trump. I, I, I don't think you could find a more dramatic difference 
between, you know, these two candidates than on the approach to the transatlantic relationship. I think Kamala Harris, like Joe Biden, is a committed transatlanticist. Her national security advisor, Phil Gordon, uh, who's a good friend, uh, probably of a number of people on this call, was uh, Assistant Secretary of State for Europe and Eurasia during Biden's first term when Phil Murphy was ambassador. Uh, he's a committed transatlanticist. Um, she is deeply committed to uh, our, our continued support, NATO's continued support to Ukraine. And, um, uh, and Joe Biden is deeply committed to uh, strengthening uh, the alliance, uh, the NATO alliance in particular, and and strengthening our relationship with our allies, uh, not just in Europe, but uh, but also in Asia. The uh, as you mentioned, the the approach of of Donald Trump, who says he'll end the war in Ukraine in a couple of days. There, there's one easy way to do that, which is you call Zelensky up and say, "No more money, no more weapons." Sue for peace with Vladimir Putin, uh, which means you pretty much got to give him what he wants. Uh, and, and, and J.D. Vance, who's probably been, he spoke at the Munich Security Conference this last year, probably been one of the most articulate people out of the MAGA movement on the whole question of why should we be spending, you know, money, resources, whatever, in uh, helping Ukraine when we have so many problems here at home. I mean, that is sort of the politically... And, and I'll say there's political appeal to this domestically, the political argument of the America First movement. And um, there are some who uh, worked with Donald Trump very closely, including his former national security advisor, John Bolton, who absolutely believe he will pull out of NATO. I'm not so sure he would do that because I think you now need the United States Senate to approve that. I don't think you could get the Senate to approve that. But it at, at for sure... The commitment to NATO, the amount of engagement, the leadership uh, that the transatlantic relationship is used to from American presidents going back to Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Obama, and now Biden would be absent uh, under these circumstances. I think that if you want an image of your head of sort of the difference between the two, think of that famous photograph of Donald Trump sitting at a G7 meeting with his arms crossed and Angela Merkel standing at the table, leaning over him with most of the G7 leaders, including John, and, and also including John Bolton, Trump's national security advisor, standing next to her. That very famous uh, photograph where, where Trump then took some candy and threw it at Merkel and said, here, don't say I never gave you anything, Angela. And so, uh, I, I mean, that I think is where we would be back to. And I think there would be a very dramatic difference now, but I'm telling you, in terms of uh, popular vote appeal or whatever, there is a, a definite domestic political appeal to that Trump point of view. Uh, but I do think there'd be a major difference in approach on the transatlantic relationship, on NATO, on Ukraine, uh, between the two, uh, the two uh, candidates for president. Juliana, maybe let me let me turn that question to you. Uh, if if Kamala Harris is elected, um, and because of the appeal that the issue has from the Trump perspective, will she be able, from your from your point of view, to to make a push that would be actually necessary to enable Ukraine to make substantial progress in the war? What is your your view on that? I don't think she differs much from what President Biden is standing for. So th this this hesitation of um, May, giving Ukraine too much too fast that we have seen in the last um, two years. I don't think this is just going away with, with her. She was very close um, probably with with the decision making process. Um, so, I mean, it 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 depends and, and it totally depends on also how, how the Congress um, uh, will be, how the majorities in Congress will be, um, what the Senate is going to look like, what the House is going to look like. So, um, she I would say when it comes to Ukraine and uh, Russia, we will see a continu continuation of, of the last years. There are other, maybe other foreign policy fields that he might have a different nuances, maybe in the Middle East conflict. Um, I don't know, but I think in Ukraine, as, especially with her being at the Munich Security Conference, um, uh, and and being there in his in his in his absence to to represent the country, I don't think she would suddenly change that um, 
that trajectory. All right, so with 15 minutes left and we know, Ambassador, you need to leave a little bit early to jump on another call. And um, we want to pick up a couple of questions from the audience. Um, one question is on the issue of the economy. We already talked briefly about it, touched upon it, um, which says where productive freedom holds low as a concern, the greatest concern is economic. Can you comment more on this? And <laughs> I ask you to, to comment briefly um, how the candidates are addressing. Well, I mean, I think uh, Juliana put it exactly right, which is that um, talking about Bidenomics and the things that economists look to. I mean, I, for instance, when I'm in Germany, I hear people saying, why are complete people in the U.S. complaining about the economy? Your unemployment is low. Inflation is coming down. Uh, your GDP is up. You've come back out of the COVID cutdown way more more quickly than we have. The answer is, as Juliana said, because of cost of living. When you look at housing prices, when you look at food prices, when you look at gas prices, uh, they're just really high. And the and yes, wages have increased in the United States, but they haven't outpaced the cost of living. And to put another way, if you get paid more, if your wages go up, you're not giving government credit for that. You're giving yourself credit for that. I worked hard. I deserve this money I'm making. If prices are going up, you blame government. And uh, and so so the, what what has to happen I, I, is sort of I think Kamala Harris needs to to be really competitive on the economy. She needs to lay out number one that she understands that, that you know the pain that people are going through on this, and number two that she has uh, a, a policies and a direction uh, that she's moving that will help to uh, address that. And and the advantage right now, all the polls show that uh, Donald Trump has an advantage on that because people go, wait a minute, during the Trump years, I could afford that house. I could afford that car or whatever. And now interest rates are so high, I can't. And so uh, it, that is, a, a I'd say, a, is a bit of a headwind for uh, the Democrats. I guarantee you that everybody's hoping that uh, in September, the Fed does start bringing down interest rates. Not that that will have an immediate impact, but it's sort of an indicator. Uh, it sort of says to the country, hey, inflation really is getting under control if we're bringing those down. Uh, whether, <laughs> excuse me, whether that happens or not will be very, very important. But I, I think Juliana put it exactly right. That's that's going to be the key question. And, and we'll be looking for that in her acceptance speech, I think, and then maybe even in her selection of a, of a vice presidential nominee. And and looking at her speech yesterday, it one of it was one of the first issues when, if not the first issue, she started with at her stump speech. So if that is the the direction we are going, she is apparently going to do that a lot if she doesn't get distracted from the debates that he tries to the fire he tries to light up yesterday. Maybe the next question also for you, Juliana, because I know you wrote an article about it and um, about uh, Kamala Harris's strengths and weaknesses. Um, what are Kamala Harris's main weaknesses in the campaign? Um, I would have to think what I wrote because I wrote too much. No, I think one of the weaknesses, of course, is she's part of this administration. So the critique is not just suddenly stopping. I mean, her her approval rates were were down for for a very long time. So she has to convince um, she has to convince the people that are skeptical about her work in the last three years. That is, I think, one of the weaknesses. Um, she um she the border issue even though she the, the borders are um wording is is not not correct but then you can also say this has to be this has to be made clearer you have to argue better why what was her responsibility back then and many even democrats told me it was a very hard task she 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 got handled uh, back then so it was almost impossible to to make any any progress on that so um with that she 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 will have to deal because this will be this will be the line of attacks from now on to 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 whatever and and um and she stands for being a very liberal Democrat since the last couple of years, which she wasn't in California. When we look back into into her um, into her career, and she tried to has to define who who she actually is, and she has to make that very quickly because she doesn't have much time. So, um, money wise, um, I think she uh, apparently there is no problem. Um, uh, and I was told that before that that wouldn't be a problem if if, it, if the if the nominee is going to change. 
Um, but she, yeah, she has to convince um, people who were skeptical for her for a long time. So they kind of woke up and said, so why are we suddenly now all all um, enthusiastic about her? And it's easy in Atlanta. It might not be as easy in, in, in other parts of the country. Maybe the last question is for you, John, um, before you need to leave us, unfortunately. Um, on China, obviously also in a very important issue for us Europeans. Um, what will be Donald Trump's China policy? Will he continue the export control restrictions on semiconductors and other new technology against China? And I might add, what will be Kamala Harris's uh, China policy? And what do we have to expect as Europeans anyway, whoever replaces Biden in the Oval Office? Well, I, I think one of the areas where you come pretty close to bipartisan consensus in the United States is tough on China policy. So I, I said you know, in calls like this uh, way back when Biden, during the 2020 campaign, don't expect a huge amount of difference between the Biden approach to China and the Trump approach to China. And it, with one exception, and the 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 proof of the, the not much difference is that I don't believe Joe Biden took down a single tariff on China that Trump had imposed. Uh, you know, Biden is, is also very much has sort of a protectionist bent. He comes out of the labor movement. I mean, that's very much part of his uh, his politics and his background. And um, uh, and and I would say that um, uh, that the exception is that it was of interest to the Biden administration to sort of bring down the temperature on the rhetoric and to recognize that there are certain areas where we need to cooperate and coordinate with China. One of them is on climate change. The second is on nuclear non-proliferation. And the third one, uh, which I think the Trump administration would also agree with, they probably wouldn't agree with the first two, is, uh, is on controlling the export of fentanyl into the United States and getting control, because a lot of that stuff comes from China, It gets on the streets of the United States and Canada, literally tens of thousands of, of kids have been killed with Uh, overdoses because of fentanyl in the last, you know, even, you know, year, year and a half. So, uh, so those are three areas of cooperation. I think, uh, I think the, the difference is Trump has talked about imposing a 60% tariff on number of areas uh, in terms of uh, exports from China and um, would probably uh, move more quickly towards actually an actual decoupling I think a uh, Harris administration would uh, continue to be tough on China, but but it would be much more of a rifle shot approach. It would be focused on uh, limiting or eliminating uh, any exports or investments that could help China develop uh, in areas like AI, quantum computing, uh, highly sophisticated biotechnology research, of course, the highly sophisticated semiconductor development and research, and obviously, of course, any kind of military grade technology or even dual use technology that could help uh, China improve their military capabilities. I think it would be uh, much more of a rifle shot approach on that, and then also trying to coordinate with things like climate change and nuclear nonproliferation. I think that would be that would be sort of a difference. But but by and large, you're talking both of them uh, with a an approach of being much tougher, if you will, on on China than perhaps uh, Europe is today. That's a very important point, Juliana. Maybe return that to you. Are, are we Europeans aware of that? Are we prepared? I think some people are aware of that, and some people are a little bit concerned about the, what what's going to be that. No matter who is going to win uh, the White House, um, uh, the Americans will ask us to be more on their side and and distance ourselves from China, which is not really easy for this um, economy, as many people know better in this call than I do, probably. Um, so the, the the pressure will be high. I think with the Republican Party, it's this feeling of we need to kind of get 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 a little bit away from Europe to 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 shift even more to China. That is much more with the Republican Party than it is for the Democratic Party, even though um, it's not a new thing. And we have talked about this in the last decades. But it is this 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 clear thing that the big 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 um, challenge is China. So we need to be freed from from uh, Russia, Europeans have to take care of Russia more um, than uh, than us uh, doing this. So that's probably one of the big difference from my perspective. 
So I just want to apologize for having to leave early. Uh, thank uh, Atlantic Brooka, thank uh, Jakob and uh, Juliana for, and hopefully you guys will continue the conversation. Uh, Jakob, I have to do your job in a phone call with second gentleman, Doug Emhoff right now. So I'm going to have to jump, but thank you, Zygmar Gabriel. Thank you, Yulia Friedlander. Uh, and of course, Steve Sokol from American Council in Germany for putting this all together. And I'll see all of you later. I'm sure we'll be doing another one of these before Election Day. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Hey, hi. So hey, hi from us. <laughs> okay, absolutely. Good luck. All right, we can we can just continue for four more, four more minutes. We have left on the clock and we have a couple of more questions that you are certainly um, more than competent to, to respond to. Um, one question is um, on the enthusiasm we mentioned early in the call. Um, the Marga Wars remains confident of victory. How sustainable is the enthusiasm for VP Harris? Can it carry her uh, to November? And I might add, as Germans, we know how fast uh, Schulz Zug can derail. So <laughs> do you think it will be sustainable for the next three months? That is the big question. And um, uh, that is the question we are all um, writing about and trying to figure out how sustainable it's going to be. I think it is it is much bigger than we would have thought. And everybody who knew it uh, two weeks ago, um, I'm not I'm not really trusting this, um, uh, that this was uh, known. So I think that is a momentum. It's not that long. It's I mean, it's less than 100 days. It's a little po bit more than than three months. Um, I think that if she if she if the Democratic Party is lucky, this is just the, the perfect timing for this kind of comeback um, uh, at the mountain that you you take the, the energy to at least make it as competitive as it can be. I think it will be and it will be with most of the candidates on, on, on the ticket. It will be very competitive and it's probably um, we don't know until, as, as John Emerson said, until until the end who, who actually won, because it is just decided in so many so little states, as we all know. Um, but I think the enthusiasm is is big. Um, it's uh, interesting to watch, and it's good mood. Um, and it's summer, so why not? I mean, um, uh, we'll see how that plays out in in the swing states. Yeah, and you mentioned that it's very close in all the swing states. There were now just some polls from Bloomberg, I believe, coming in that showed Kamala Harris in pretty good shape in all the six swing swing states. But I guess we just have to wait another question to squeeze in on that. Um, is could it be an advantage for Kamala Harris that she only has some 100 days, three months left until the election, um, rather than the opposite, which some other experts think? I think there's an opinion for both, um, and experts have all the opinions we need. But I think it's there's one argument that you can say she didn't have a competitive primary season, which kind of... When this happens, you also you also kind of lay open the weaknesses in your own party when you attack each other. She didn't have to do that, so she she's free of that. The, the danger, on the other hand, is that and that that is written um, a lot in the last days that she needs to define herself before the other party does it. So she needs to say who she is and who, what people people know her, but people don't know her that well. So I, I was always fascinated in the last years how often I wrote a portrait of about her because people always ask me what is happening what's going on with her where is she what is she doing why don't we read more of her so the interest is still high people want to know who she is and she needs to lead that discussion and make her point and tell us who she wants to be uh, when she when she wins the white house um so it is a risk and a challenge i think um a risk and a chance um i think if she she should be able to use the chance but um, Donald Trump is also not a beginner um, in this field. So we will see what he's going to do. He certainly isn't. And maybe the last question. Um, many people in the chat are interested, obviously, in uh, Harris's vice presidential pick. And you already revealed that <laughs> you're pretty <laughs> much in favor of Gretchen Whitmer. Um, but what about Andy Bashir, the governor of Kentucky, in a very conservative state? I mean, it's impressive how how he how he managed to do that. Um, so I think he's one of the one of the possible um, three or four we are, uh, um, candidates we are talking about. Um, I think it really comes down to to who she knows better, who she feels confident with, and who probably also doesn't 
make her competition. So that's also the decision she she is going to make. Um, but it's I think it's interesting how many we suddenly how, on how many governors we look in the Democratic Party that are actually uh, able to 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 fill that role in in a good way. So uh, for the for the Democratic Party in a good way. Um, so I I still I still think it's going to be Josh Shapiro, but. Um, uh, I don't know if I would make a decision. Do I want to surprise people or do I want to give them what they already expect? What kind of excitement do you need on a day like this? It will be her first major decision um, uh, that she's going to make. And apparently she has made it already. So we we can, we can just uh, interpret what it means that she has her first campaign in, event with her running mate in Pennsylvania. Yes, but the good news is we just have to wait for five more days. Then we will know more. <laughs> And probably, as the ambassador mentioned earlier uh, in the conversation, there will be another Black Swan event. So we will also wait what that might be. And um, with that, Juliana, I would like to thank you very much on behalf of both uh, the American Council of Germany and Atlantic Brücke for taking one hour, one precious hour of your vacation, actually, to share your insights with us. Also, of course, uh, thanks to Ambassador Jonah Emerson. Um, I think it was... Even though we couldn't really figure out who will win the election, it will remain close. We don't know who will be the vice presidential pick. We don't know what will happen. A lot can happen, as we have learned over the past four weeks. And you will be certainly busy after your vacation, going back to the US and covering uh, the campaigns until November 5th. Thank you for taking your time. Thank you to all the listeners in the audience and for staying for one hour in this call, wherever you are in the morning in or at noon in the United States or in Germany in the evening. We will definitely do more of these uh, conversations in the three months to come. And with that, have a good evening, have a good day, and thank you very much. Thank you.